I'm Colonel Jeremy Hansen, an astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency, and, and I see the world's changing climate as our biggest challenge. Jeremy Hansen is the next Canadian in line to go to space. A former CF-18 fighter pilot with a master's degree in physics, he was selected for the Canadian Space Program back in 2009. Since then, Hansen has been immersed in training, including spacewalks and robotics, while working at NASA's Mission Control Centre in Houston. It's given him a unique perspective on Canada and the whole planet, which he says faces a shared challenge, climate change. Spoiler alert, he says we can look to space for the solution. Here's his big fix. Hi, Colonel Jeremy Hansen, how are you? I'm great. Thanks very much for doing this. So you identify climate change as the biggest problem Canada is facing. Why, why is that from your perspective? Well, climate change is a, is a global problem, obviously. And it ultimately, when you kind of look forward at what climate change is going to do to our planet, and it's based on a general warming, it's going to affect the basic needs of all of us, for everybody. So you're talking about food, uh, water, uh, our health and safety, and, and basically it's going to challenge us in, to uh, find ways for pe people to actively contribute to the solutions, and it, it's not going to be easy for us. I want to get into what the solution might be. The series is called The Big Fix, but before that, just can we delve in a bit, uh, a bit more specifically into how you think Canada in particular is being impacted by this, why you think it's such a big problem in this country? I, I take the point, obviously, it's global, but yeah. what are you seeing here in Canada? Yeah, well, it's interesting, actually. So globally, we acknowledge that we see on average about a one degree temperature rise around the planet. But in northern latitudes, where we are in Canada, we actually see double that. And, and that's because climate change is having a bigger impact initially on the northern latitudes. Because as the ice sheets, uh, as they shrink, you have less of that white ice reflecting energy back into space. And so this is kind of like it's a, it, it just builds upon itself and it cycles back and it's making the problem worse. Uh, we have uh, a tremendous amount of permafrost landmass in Canada. And the effects of that permafrost melting and the carbon that it could potentially release, it's not exactly understood yet, but we think that there's maybe twice as much carbon stored in the permafrost in the Arctic region as there, as there is in all of the forest biomass around the planet. So there are going to be some significant impacts to Canada. In less scientific terms, does that mean, for example, for people watching, that the extreme weather that we've seen quite often, those hundred-year storms that seem to be happening every year, is that, is that going to be more of the norm? I think that's exactly what's going to happen. So as the, as the temperature rises around the globe, what you have is more energy, you have more water in, in the atmosphere, and the way that water is moving around is changing. And that's, that really comes to kind of the, big, the first issue that I mentioned, which is water for us, a basic need of water. So you, you, have, a, you have changes in how that water is moving around. So we, have, we see it manifest today in, in larger storms, storms uh, that we didn't see happening, or maybe the 100-year storm every year, as you put it. I'm glad you brought that up. But the other thing you're going to notice is that some of the water sources that we rely on are eventually going to disappear, such as glaciers in, in, the, in the mountains, for example, and they're going to have impacts. The other, based on those storms that we're talking about, um, you have a change in how water moves around. So you're going to have areas that have too much water, you're going to have other areas that don't have any water. And, and those kind of changes are going to be a real stressor for humanity as we just try to provide the basic needs for each other around the globe. So as we look towards a solution, given that I know there isn't you know, one simple way to put it, what, what is the fix from your perspective? Well, I think the, probably if people were to take one thing away from, from this show, it would probably be the idea that you, we just need to shift our mindset to when we address regional concerns, we need to address them globally. And we need to be contributing to a global network of solutions so that we don't have duplication of solutions around the planet, but we're contributing one small area. So I can give you some, some examples Please, that yeah. we're already doing. So let's say um, you want to uh, address how water is moving around uh, our planet, where the ice is, where the permafrost is, where it's melted, where it hasn't, uh, uh, what the soil conditions are in, you know, for farmers in Canada. The best way to do that is from space. And so, you know, we, historically we've had other ways to do those types of things, but if you choose a space solution, you can do it for the, whole for the entire globe at once. 
And we're already doing that with uh, RadarSat Constellation and our previous, uh, the, the previous satellites in the RadarSat family, uh, a niche Canadian technology. But we, if you put a satellite in orbit around the Earth, around like from north to south around the poles, and then the planet spins underneath that orbit, you can image the entire planet. So while you're providing a solution for Canadians, you're starting to provide a global picture. And tackling climate change is about understanding the global picture, not just about looking at a region, but understanding where is all of the water and how is it moving and how is that changing over time with a data set that's continuous over decades. So let me ask you two things based on that. Is it the government that would drive that solution in space, like that would drive putting that up there? Is that, is that who you envision leading that charge? I think the Canadian government has already positioned Canada to do this. And so I think you're, you're touching on something that's really important. And that's another mind shift is that it's not just government anymore. It's industry and government and academia in partnership. We already see a huge shift in the space program, for example, towards this commercialization of space. Uh, really great example, Canadian example, GHGSAT. Um, it's a commercial company and they're monitoring methane and carbon dioxide from space. Um, you know, government has fostered that. Uh, certainly, but it is a commercial company standing on its own two feet. And, and in fact, this year they're going to provide a global map of these greenhouse gases on a, on a resolution of two by two kilometers. And then if people need more resolution, they, they can pay for it. But that's going to be a free resource for the entire globe on carbon and methane. And that's, that's commercial industry at its best. So let me ask you before I let you go then, a kind of more political question. And that is whenever that sort of argument is put forth, this idea that this is a global problem, not just one here in Canada. Sometimes it's used in a way that is almost designed to say, well, we don't need to do, not necessarily as much, but we don't, you know, we don't need to take the strongest actions because actually we're not doing all, you know, we're not the mass contributors to this. Mm -hmm. It is a global thing. And I'm not trying to take away from that argument at all, but I wonder what you say to that argument that, that sort of employs what you're saying in a way to say, does that mean Canada should do less? Yeah. No, and so that's, you know, that, that coming back to that biggest takeaway. If you look at, um, you know, you can develop, you can further develop industries that are serp replacing existing services that we already use, but you can develop them in a way that you're doing it at a global scale. And so it's not actually costing you more money, you're just being intentional about how you design the solution. And so we're doing that all the time in space right now, and that's kind of our job at the Canadian Space Agency in partnership with other government departments, but is, to, is just to be part of the brain trust that's saying, yeah, you could bury more fiber in the ground, for example, but you could also look at a, you know, enabling um, high bandwidth internet around the entire planet. Another project that we're already working on with a great Canadian company, Telesat, and uh, they're going to be delivering internet from space. And we already do that from space, but delivering internet from low, Earth orbit, which means you can have high bandwidth, high speed internet delivered from space everywhere around the world. And you know, where that ties into is that enables the 7 billion people on the planet to work together to be unilaterally informed about the reality of what's happening to our planet. And that's how you get 700 or 7 billion people actually working towards a common goal. And so th solutions like that are really, really important. Another, you know, that also ties into replacing infrastructure. So as you, like weather, for example, you know, typically, or today, we rely on a lot of ground stations for uh, understanding the weather, at least in the southern uh, latitudes of Canada. But the Arctic is so important to the climate change puzzle, we can't afford to put weather stations all over the Arctic. But if we can learn to do it in space, from space and use this global connectivity, then, uh, then we can afford to not only solve our own weather challenges in southern and northern latitudes, but to contribute around the world. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Colonel Hansen. Pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.